conception was due to be born to a woman somewhere on earth within nine months time. He actually wrote, Babylon is incarnate upon the earth today, awaiting the proper hour for her manifestation. Now, if one could believe these writings, you would expect that a female child was to be born around 1947, and indeed such an influential feminist was delivered that year, who could offer the most promise for identifying the fruit of Parsons' infamous ritual, and that would be none other than Hillary Rodham Clinton. Intriguingly, um, Parsons later referred again to the Babylon Scarlet Woman, and this time by a particular name in his Book of the Antichrist. On October 31, 1948, a full 69 years ago, when the female child would have been around one year of age, Parsons wrote that the spirit of Babylon came to him, but this time identifying itself as Hilarion, who, he said, would grow on to become an international public figure dedicating to bringing the work of the Antichrist to fruition. Why is that important? Because the etymology of Hilarion is the arcane Hillary. Now, you have to ask yourself how many internationally influential feminists were born in 1947 who are named Hillary and that have the potential to become the leader or vice president or influence the election of the President of the United States, the most powerful nation on earth that was dedicated from its inception to the enthronement of Osiris Apollo, who the Bible itself recognizes as Antichrist, and also ask how possible it would be that an entity calling itself Hillary made clear to Jack Parsons 69 years ago that it was dedicated to helping the rise of the man of sin. According to Bill Clinton in a number of books, Hillary Clinton uh, has been involved with uh, Wicca, uh, gone to so-called Wicca meetings or quote churches in Los Angeles and she would decorate the White House Christmas tree according to uh, Gary Aldridge with occultic like figurines. Uh, that's rather bizarre, I would think. She was involved in communicating with the dead, much like Eleanor Roosevelt did. All these questions came to my mind recently when reading the WikiLeaks email revelations and remembering how Hillary had hinted that alien disclosure would come if she was elected president and how the people around her, Abramovic, the Podestas, others close to Hillary, affiliates of hers, were manifest believers in the same UFOs and what they call contiguous aliens, the same that Parsons and Hubbard sought through the Church of Scientology and so on that's actually based on an alien called Xenu, as well as being practitioners of the same Crowley occultism that Parsons and Hubbard were devotees of. When you consider all this, it, it seems to be immediately um, beyond the probability of coincidence um, that in the days leading up to the last presidential election, these modern Telemus actually believed that Hillary is, or that she could be, the incarnation of the archetype divine feminine, the whore of Babylon, the Hilarion that is set to take the throne of the most powerful nation on earth to assist the Antichrist in his bid to rule the entire world. This constant theme of the Whore of Babylon, or the worship of the Babylonian goddess, saturates the American system. From the steeples of government buildings and cathedrals, all the way to the Statue of Liberty off the coast of New York. It has always been a mainstay of the American system. Whether we're dealing with Lady Liberty, Athena, Isis, or even Gaia, we are constantly being inundated with this ancient occult theme of goddess worship across our land. But how would the cabal strategically embed this idea of goddess worship into the culture of the everyday American citizen? How could they condition a society into following after such a perversion on a massive scale? America's introduction to accepting a pagan worldview in a serious way began April 22nd, 1970. It happened in high schools, it happened in colleges, thousands of high schools and colleges. April 22nd, 
1970, was America's first national environmental teach-in, America's first Earth Day. When America's first Earth Day was introduced, the national teach-in, Friends of the Earth put together a handbook called the Environmental Handbook. Really simple. And in the Environmental Handbook, the very first set of essays and articles introduces the reader to a Smokey the Bear Sutra, where Smokey the Bear comes to America's youth as a mystical being coming to crush the butts of the capitalists, to crush out the cigarette butts, of course that's the imagery of Smokey the Bear, crush out the butts of those who see exceptionalism, that see differences, that see uniqueness, that see separation. Now it doesn't quite say exactly that, but that's what you can read between the lines. Later on in the Environmental Handbook, Lynn White Jr. has an essay. It's a very famous essay. In fact, this essay really set the tone for the environmental movement. The essay demonstrated that Christianity is to blame. The world's ecological crisis rests on Christian shoulders. And until we move away from a Christian worldview, until we move away from a Christian ethos, we will continue to have a worsening ecologic crisis. What's interesting is Lynn White Jr. said what we need is a new religion. We need a new way of looking at the world through a different lens. No longer Christianity, but some other religious construct. Towards the back end of the Environmental Handbook, you have a list of acceptable religions, acceptable religious practices. Buddhism, shamanism, earth-friendly religions. Christianity, right out. No longer, no longer necessary. Christianity is the problem. The solution is opening ourselves up to new forms of spirituality, an earth-friendly, earth-centric, earth-loyalty-based spirituality. And that flavoring of the very first Earth Day comes through all the way to now. America was introduced to Gaia, to the Mother Earth, to the ancient idea that the Earth is alive as a spiritual entity on April the 22nd, 1970. When we consider Gaia and Gaia worship, the idea of a great mother, we can go all the way back through ancient times and see elements of her scattered throughout different cultures. Ishtar, Isis, Diana, Athena. What's interesting is the great mother, the great goddess, Gaia, to use that language, because becomes almost an umbrella mother that absorbs all into her because it's all built around continuity and oneness.